Sometimes we have to work with them a bit. All right, we're set, all right. <clears throat> well, this morning earlier, we have uh, discussed the message that God gave through Wagner and Jones. And uh, we're not going to be discussing that at this moment, in this session, except that we are. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to be talking about the people and we're not going to be talking about Minneapolis, but we're going to be discussing the central principle involved in that message, a message that we must hear and must understand. That message this morning, the message they gave then that we need now is that Christ is our only righteousness. Christ crucified is our only hope. He died as our substitute. We don't have to die. No one has to die. Everyone who dies will choose to die by refusing or resisting or ignoring Christ, our righteousness. Every day of our lives, according to the principles they brought, every day of our lives, our focus must be upon Christ. And if it is not Christ crucified, it is not the true Christ. Only one Christ was crucified. When he was crucified, two things came together, law and grace. Mercy and justice kissed each other. The Christ on the cross declares there's no way for anyone to be saved except by paying the penalty, which is death. And we can't be saved that way. But when we pay it through Christ's righteousness, Christ lived our life. He died our death. When we claim his righteousness, God accepts that as full payment. But notice what happens. Two things happen at once. The law is satisfied, and the believer is saved. No matter what the sins, no matter what happened. But there's one thing that is so urgent, and that is that we must begin by recognizing our hopelessness. If we do not recognize our hopelessness, there is no hope. Our hope is in recognizing our hopelessness and claiming his answer. Amen. And the answer is very simple. Christ lived and died so that we can die and live. Amen. We die to self that we may live to Christ. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Repentance is God's message, method of helping us to receive humility. We talked this morning about the need for humility. But brothers and sisters, you can't produce humility. You can do nothing about it except to receive it. And there's only one way to receive it. And that is to receive it by claiming the righteousness of Christ. But that requires a painful recognition of the hopelessness of our own righteousness. And until we recognize that, repentance is God's method for receiving humility, which is the key to reformation and revival. Now that, since our new general, the latest general conference, our officers, that is their, the officers at that general conference chose that the, the theme for, for this whole fa a quinquinium would be reformation and revival. Amen. But brothers and sisters, there is no true 
Reformation without revival. And there's no revival without Reformation. And both of these hinge on the depths of our repentance. When Peter was asked, what shall we do? He told them, you know, you've slain the, the Holy One. What shall we do? Well, his answer was simple, repent. But you know what? I find that I can't repent. I can't repent any more than I can give up my pride. But when God gives a command through any of his servants, his biddings are his enablings. If God calls for us to do something, then he stands ready. And it is the revival and reformation we must have to prepare for the sealing and the latter rain. And that, brothers and sisters, is a requirement before Christ can come. And until his servants are sealed in their foreheads, the latter rain cannot come and Christ will not come. Now, one morning, I was just thinking, as I was looking at my experience, and I was thinking of uh, Pastor Larry. Uh, Larry, I was younger, I'm sure, than you were when I first met you. But I was just a young man. Uh, well, I expect I could remember, I guess, about 20, 20 uh, probably 28 and that's, you aren't too much older than that, I don't think, probably early 30s when I first met you. But you know what? I had an experience back there that I have always cherished ever since. And it was a strange experience. I was in my study that morning and my, was reading Christ's Object Lessons, a wonderful book. And by the way, that book comes alongside of Desire of Ages, which is the greatest book I know of, aside from the Bible. Well, unless it's Steps to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a little briefer form. And then, of course, I'd have to start mentioning others because there's so, so much, so many wonderful uh, gifts that God has given to us. But I was reading the chapter of the two worshipers, which begins about, I think it's about 152, page 152 of Christ's Object Lessons. We don't show the reference here yet. I think I split a, a, a group, so one was left without it, but you'll get it in a moment. As I read that this morning, that morning, it left a deep impression on, my, on me, and I'm going to read through to you a few of the paragraphs in that chapter that led to an experience that I will share with you. The Pharisee and the publican represent two great classes into which those who come to worship God are divided. Many people come to worship God and never worship Him. And they go away empty. Their first two representatives were the first two children born into this world. Cain thought himself righteous, and he came to God for the thank offering only. He made no confession of sins and acknowledged no need of mercy. Now that was pretty extreme, but it's, it's really par for mankind. Now, even people who recognize that they need some change seldom understand the corruption of their nature. But Abel came with the blood pointed to the Lamb of God. He came as a sinner, confessing himself lost. His only hope was the unmerited love of God. The Lord had respect to his offering, but to Cain and his offering he had no respect. The sense of need, the recognition of our poverty and sin is the very first condition of acceptance with God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. For each of the classes represented by the Pharisee and the publican, there's a lesson in the history of the Apostle Peter. 
In his early discipleship, Peter thought himself strong. Like the Pharisee, in his own estimation, he was not as other men are. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment and confess that Peter is me. And as I, as I read that, this, that, I realized the Holy Spirit was speaking very clearly to me. And I realized that I felt more righteous than others. Well, I mean, shouldn't I after all? I grew up in a family who were con committed to God's word and trained us in a different way than mm, certainly than other people in the world and than the majority of Adventist family. I was better than others. I really was. I could do what Paul said. You know, if there's any boasting, I could, I could do it. I was uh, born, you know, uh, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and so forth. Well, as I was thinking about that this morning, that particular morning, my mind was, was being challenged. I recognize those, Peter, but what do you do about it? After all, reality is reality, isn't it? I mean, how can you compare yourself to people who are not even Adventists or people who are Adventists and not, you know, don't follow the diet, dietary plan? And You understand what I'm saying now? People who don't really believe in the spirit of prophecy or people that, you know, how are we going to recognize? And so I was praying that morning because I sensed that I couldn't properly repent. I didn't, well, I knew I needed to repent, but internally I didn't feel that way. And so <clears throat> the Pharisee in his own estimation was not as other men and I wasn't as other men. I, I couldn't see that. When Christ, on the eve of his betrayal, trail, forewarned his disciples, all ye shall be offended because of me this night, Peter confidently declared, although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Peter did not know his own danger. Self-confidence misled him. He thought himself able to withstand temptation. But in a few short hours, the test came. And with cursing and swearing, he denied his Lord. The evil that led to Peter's fall and that shut out the Pharisee from communion with God is proving the ruin of thousands today. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is most hopeless, most incurable. Of course, my pride was not like other men. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was talking to me. I sensed the need to respond. But how? You can't produce repentance, nor could I. You can't humble yourself. You can make a choice, but you can't do it. Self cannot overcome self. And so I had a, a strong, strange battle that morning. Those who accept Christ, these are just scattered statements from what I was reading. Those who accept Christ and in their first confidence say, I am saved, are in danger of trusting to themselves. They lose sight of their own weakness and their constant need of divine strength. They're unprepared for Satan's devices and under temptations, temptation many, like Peter, fall into the very depths of sin. We're admonished, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now I had 
was familiar with that last po uh, statement and, and had often thought of it. And, and yet, I sensed that something great, a greater need, a need I didn't know what to do about. I was a pastor. I'd been in the ministry for several years. Now, I'm face to face with the counsel of God and the Holy Spirit says, you are the man. And now what do I do about it? It's not enough to read these things. We must face them and recognize their application to ourselves. But we, that's not enough yet. We must actually apply them, but how? And that's a question. He that taketh it, standeth, take heed lest he fall. Our only safety is in constant distrust of self and dependence on Christ. It was through self, oh, we've done that one, haven't we? It was through self-sufficiency that Paul, Peter fell. It was through repentance and humiliation that his feet were again established. In the record of his experience, every repenting sinner may find encouragement. Though Peter had grievously sinned, he was not forsaken. The words of Christ were written upon his soul, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. What a wonderful thing that Jesus made that statement before. Even with that, it was a hard thing experienced for Peter. In his bitter agony of remorse, this prayer and the memory of Christ's look of love and pity gave him hope. Christ, after his resurrection, remembered Peter and gave the angel the message for the women. Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him. Peter's repentance was accepted by the sin-pardoning Savior. Tell your dis the disciples and Peter. Wasn't Peter a disciple? But why and Peter? Jesus knew that by this time he was in such deep sorrow that he did not consider himself worthy to be a disciple. And he needed that encouragement. There are times, brothers and sisters, when we see ourselves as never before. And oftentimes we feel that we are not worthy. But God says, come unto me. Jesus says, come to me. Brothers and sisters, there is no crime that anyone can commit that should prevent them from coming to Jesus. In fact, that's why he died. So that we could, no matter what our circumstances, so that we could come unto me. At the, at the same, and the same compassion that reached out to rescue Peter is extended to every soul who has fallen into temptation. It is Satan's special device to lead men into sin and then leave him helpless and trembling, fearing to seek pardon. But why should we fear when God has said, let him take hold of my strength that he might make peace, may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Every provision has been made for our infirmities, every encouragement offered us to come to Christ. Do you realize that the most painful thing for a Christian is to face the corruption of the nature, of our own nature? But that's the greatest invitation to the cross. It is the greatest invitation. Indeed, it's not only the greatest invitation, but it's the evidence. I wish this morning, actually, I brought my book, uh, Steps to Christ, in case we had a little extra time, and instead we're, we're a little bit behind time. But there's some quotations in there I'd just love to share with you. Quotations I've shared with several people within the past week, because so many need it. 
quotations that, uh, that are wonderful, and we will actually, in this chapter, be taking one of them because it's also in Steps to Christ. <clears throat> we must know our real condition or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger or we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the pain of our wounds or we shall not desire healing. Now, how many of you like that pain? Do you realize the Laodicean condition is a result of refusing to face the pain? Yeah, that's right. We, we rationalize in some way trying to make ourselves feel better rather than going to Christ and getting the account taken care of properly. Do you hear what I'm saying? You see, the Laodicean condition, and you read uh, 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 for a scripture this morning, a portion of that, the Laodicean condition is a state of insanity. You think you're rich and crisp with goods and have need of nothing, and you don't know you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, how can a person be all that state and not know it? Because we rationalize. And because our, our riches are still external. We have them. We have the greatest truth in all the world. We're rich with truth. But if that truth is not internalized, then we're poverty stricken. Wretched. Miserable. But we keep rationalizing and we, keep, we try to keep ourselves afloat by rationalizing. When brothers and sisters, all we have to do is to go to Jesus and say, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless. I'm corrupt, please cleanse me. And when we learn to come to him daily, because we are corrupt by nature no matter what we've done or said or thought, so we can come to him every day and say, please cleanse me. We can come to him as the publican who beat upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And by the way, the Greek says the sinner, not a sinner, as King James, King James has it. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. When we see ourselves as we really are, we can't be thinking about any other sinner. When I really see myself... It's, it's paralyzing. But it's a cause for joy. Because I couldn't see myself unless I am being spoken to by the Holy Spirit because I have such a defense that no one else can break through. I have, I have through the years, beginning as an infant, I begin to rationalize. Two little, little tots get into quarrel. It's always the other person who did it. He shoved me. He, you know what I mean? It's always the other person. And, and each person is sure of it. Because it's insane. When we're focusing upon ourselves and defending ourselves, that's insane. Jesus is our defense. He's our only defense. And I don't care whether we're little tots or older people or aged or whatever it is. Christ is our defense. He's our only defense. And that's what Christ our righteousness means. And this is the message of Wagner and Jones that was rejected because they thought that this would undermine law and obedience. After all, focusing on Christ, we also need to... Uh, we need to... Uh, Remember, we have to obey. Oh, yes, yes, obedience is important, brothers and sisters. But who knows more about that than anyone else? Christ. And Christ in you is your only hope of glory. And he will not be in you unless you focus your mind upon him rather than yourself. And this is why I'm going to mention again what I did this morning. Conservative... Uh, do I dare say this? You may not know me well enough. You may think of some strange things, but I'm going to dare. Liberals are apostate and conservatives are bankrupt. Amen. 
Is that too strong? Brothers and sisters, we're bankrupt. Why? Because we have not claimed the riches of Christ. Not consistently and as we ought. I'm talking about as a people. I'm not talking about individuals. God knows the individual. But as a corporate body, we are bankrupt. And I'm talking about conservative Adventism. Let me tell you something. If conservative Adventism, if, if, if we as conservatives had the key, had an understanding, had internalized this message, Christ would have come a long time ago. Yeah. Now, if God's servant was right, and if she wasn't, then God has not led us at all. then Christ should have come soon after the message is given because that message, according to her, was soon to have resulted in the loud cry and the latter rain. The very fact that people still argue over whether we accepted the message or didn't. There is no question. Well, there's no need to argue. This is a hundred and a quarter, uh, this is a century and a quarter later and we're still here. Why should there be any discussion over it? If that was the message to, to prepare us for Christ's coming, then why are we still here? If we accepted it and have continued to... Well, brothers and sisters, it doesn't even matter if we have a theological concept of it and can write it out, like in books that I've written. If we don't experience it, it's not real anyway. You see, the Minneapolis message is not primarily a theology. It's an experience. Amen. God is telling us how to experience righteousness by a focus on Christ and assurance of what his responsibility will be if we do. It is his responsibility to give us Victory. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about pacifism. I'm not suggesting that all we do is, is, is uh, try to think about Christ and that we don't have to make decisions. Paul tells us the key. It's God that works in us both to will and to do. And when we focus on Christ, that is the greatest motivating power to will. Amen. But it's also power to do. But we have focused too largely on the law. Liberals have, missed, have tried to correct that by uh, shifting the law aside, and they've, dis they've destroyed the unity of law and grace. But we have too. And they've tried to correct us by doing the opposite way. When we come to the place where we thank God from the depths of our soul for exposing our corruption. He'll be able to do something for us. But otherwise, we're going to hide like Adam and Eve in the garden. They had to hide because they weren't ready to face themselves yet. And therefore, they hid as though that would as, as though they could really hide from God. We hide from God and the Laodicean condition is the evidence of it. Brothers and sisters, we need to face ourselves squarely and recognize that it's our very condition that causes the compassion of God to, to reach forth to us. We need to have the sense of pain of our wounds or we're not going to see, seek healing. That morning, I felt the pain of my wounds. As I was there, I was asking him to do for me, and he was doing it right then. But I didn't know it. Uh, are you listening? I was asking him, and I didn't feel like that was happening yet, and so I was begging him for something I didn't have, which I still don't have and never have had, but I have been able to experience it. That is, when I say have, I'm talking about my possession. I have never been humble. But God has helped me to choose humility. And when he promises, he, he produces. But I live 
day by day by asking him to do for me what I cannot do for myself. And I can't do it any more than I could when, uh, was it, 62 years ago or whatever. No, I can't do it any more than I could then. But I've learned more and more that this principle is true. It's the principle of the Minneapolis message. It's the principle that was rejected. The underlying principle. A refusal to face the pain of our wounds. And Smith and Butler represent me. Except God has helped me to see that. But they, it's true. They represent my pride. And a pride I cannot get rid of. But I can give it to Christ. And claim his righteousness. Isn't that what Christ our righteousness means? But it doesn't mean anything unless we face the pain of our wounds. Well, now we're on a different... Yes, that is. It's still the same page. Now, it is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation is of self is to be made, but at every advanced state it is to be renewed. Every advanced state. Brothers and sisters, we're through with the, uh, w- w- with the pictures in the PowerPoint. And uh, I need my Bible. I had it here earlier today. Here it is. And you need your Bible. And we're going to take a little time, and I'm going to finish that story through the book of Ezekiel, because that's where God led me. Ezekiel 36. Now, if you will turn with me to Ezekiel 36, while you're looking it up, I'll tell you the problem I faced that day. I left that morning for, for uh, visitation ministry, uh, to, to, to uh, visit various people. And I was so busy that morning, I, I suddenly looked at my watch and found that the noon hour had passed. I hadn't gone home to get a lunch, but right then it was almost time for me to be 17 miles south of there to give a Bible study to Sister Heath. Now, Sister Heath was not just an ordinary person. Sister Heath had been a... A, 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 a Baptist Sunday school teacher for 40 years and a godly woman. You could tell by visiting with her, the Holy Spirit radiated from her, and here I am late. That wasn't the real problem. The real problem is that I didn't dare go. I was overwhelmed with a sense of uncleanness. A sense that is hard to describe. And I felt that she would read me like a book. Here I have a precious message to give to her, but I don't dare go because I'm afraid of spoiling the message. And I'll tell you, I still remember it keenly. It was a very intense sense of urgency with which I pled with God. Lord, what can I do? Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I was impressed to do. And I'm not suggesting that God normally does that. But I was driving and I had to get there. I was already late. And I reached over in my Bible case and unbuckled it with my right hand. You know, those of you who are a little older remember those cases we all used to carry, just, just size enough for a Bible and a hymnal. Some of you know, little black cases, we all had them. I opened that case, pulled the Bible out and opened it in, opened to Ezekiel 36. And I was desperate. And I would glance down at some of the words and then I would ponder them and look back, of course, because I was driving and I'm not saying this is the kind of thing to advertise, but that's where I was. 
And what I looked at to begin with, let me read it to you, Ezekiel 36, verse 17. My eyes first hit this son of man. When the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways, way, and by their doings, which were not good. I've lost my place in the hammock. By the way, if I had my glasses on, it would be easier. <laughs> uh, here we are. <clears throat> by their own way and by their doings, their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. I... Yeah, I thought to myself, well, that's me. Defiled it because of our own way. Now, I didn't say anything about the hideousness of the way, but it was our own way that defiled it. God wasn't speaking to me about some crime I'd committed. He wasn't even speaking to me of some sin I committed. He was speaking to me about my uncleanness. And that was what he wanted to talk to me about. That's what he talked to me about in the morning. And by the way, I had no idea at this time. My mind never went back to, yet to my worship period. I was not aware that God was answering my prayer. But here I was. I asked God for repentance. And now he's doing it in a way that is very painful. Something that is really a bit frightening. Here I am. Sister Heath is a, a godly woman. And I have a marvelous message to share. But I'm unclean. And my uncleanness may very well cause her to despise the message that she needs. Well, I looked again. Verse 20. And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. And they said to them, These are the people of the Lord who are gone forth out of his land. Just by claiming to be God's people, they profaned his name further. Brothers and sisters, God has called us as a people in this world to reflect the character of Christ. But by calling ourselves the remnant, and by the way, I do believe that God has called us to be the remnant, and, uh, and I don't say we aren't, but, but to really be the remnant is going to require the painful experience of uh, recognizing our nakedness and our uncleanness and thanking God for it and praising him, and recognizing that he is answering our prayers. This is what we've been praying for all the time. And yet, as Laodiceans, we pray for it, and then when it happens, we try to protect ourselves somehow. It's too, too painful. And we rationalize that we really, uh, maybe not quite that bad, or at least, you know, certainly there are others much worse. I'm talking about other admins around us, maybe other ministers much worse, whatever. You know, well, I continued to glance down, not reading all of it, but here and there. And verse 22, therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes. O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, whether you went. Now he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to solve this problem. But I want you to know, it's not for your sakes. It's for my holy name's sake that I'm going to do it. What's he going to do? Verse 23. I will sanctify my great name, which was be profaned among the heathen, whither you have prof profaned it in the mid in the midst of them. Now, how many times does he have to tell them they've profaned it? 
must be pretty important. Over and over and over again, you profaned, you have profaned, you profaned, you have profaned. Brothers and sisters, we have profaned God's name so many times and hardly ever really aware of it. What is it that has prevented our message from going with loud cry power? It's our own uncleanness. That's what it is. And the uncleanness is centered on the letter P-R-I-D-E. The center letter is I, pride. Well, ah, that began to give me some encouragement. Before I thought he, I knew he was speaking to me. My uncleanness, because I already sensed it. But now he says, don't worry. I'm not able to do it for your sake. You don't, you're not worthy of it. But I'm going to do something for my holy name's sake. I'm going to sanctify it in you. Oh, in you. Brothers and sisters, God plans to sanctify his name in us. But only when we understand that it is not for our sake, but for his sake. That is, in other words, we don't deserve it, but he's giving it, he's giving us the opportunity. And he intends to do it through us. And Christ will never come until he reveals himself clearly through all of his people who are not shaken out. Now, I haven't mentioned the shaking time, but this is a part of the whole story. Those who are not sealed with the seal of the living God will receive the mark of the beast. And they will, like Peter, no matter what they think they'll stand, they will fall, but with no mediator left on the mercy seat. It's a serious thing, according to the Bible and spirit of prophecy. The great majority of God's professed people will depart. Will become, as Ellen White said, base metal. But no one will fall who keeps looking to Jesus. Amen. Who claims his righteousness. No one will succeed who in any wise continues to defend themselves. And it's so instinctive to defend ourselves. Christ said, let me justify you. I can do it easily. All you have to do is to come to me and, and, and acknowledge your uncleanness and ask for cleansing and I will give it to you. And it doesn't matter what your track record has been. It doesn't matter how many times you've failed. It doesn't matter how much you failed. If you just come to me, I will give you a new page. And that page will have written at the heading Christ's righteousness. See, you'll have it immediately. Do you re realize we cannot produce perfection, but we can receive it immediately? And then he can do in and through us what he has promised to do. So it is not a substitute for obedience. As our leaders thought when they rejected that message. No, no substitute for obedience. It's a method of obedience. Our method of obedience is to look to Jesus Christ and claim his purity right from the beginning. And that will give us the focus we need so that we will have victory in our lives that we couldn't have at all, even if we intensely tried to become perfect. All that happens, listen, why is the church, why did it become Laodicean? Oh, because we try to perfect ourselves. And we're looking to ourselves and we're comparing ourselves with other selves that aren't serious as we are. You understand what I'm saying? Christ, our righteousness, we can have him today. This morning, well, it's not morning yet. <laughs> we're past that. But this, now, this hour, we can have. The righteousness of Jesus. I'm always finished, but I have a little more here. Verse 20, 
3, 5. I, then I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse you. And those idols, by the way, can be spelled S-E-L-F. Self. Ellen White says, under the heading of selfishness came every other sin. And pride is a solar plexus of selfishness. And that is the uncleanness that we must face. If we do not sense our pride in a way that is painful, then we have not had, according to Steps to Christ, page 65, we have not had an adequate view of Christ. When we see him as he really is, that is what brings repentance. A new heart, verse 26, also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And now, when you go to the verse 29, it says, I will also save you from your uncleannesses. I repeat their assurance. But verse 31 is the one that really hit me and has repeatedly since then. Then, verse 31 begins with then. Then, what are we talking about? When? When we have been cleansed. When the new heart. When all of these things have happened, then you will remember your own evil ways and your doings which were not good and shall loathe yourselves in the sight of God. Now, brothers and sisters, how can we loathe ourselves and still rejoice in Christ's righteousness? Now, I've raised that question because I want to answer it. And I want to say that we cannot claim his righteousness without loathing ourselves. And it is the loathing of ourselves, even if God has given us victories, even if he has purified us. Indeed, it is when he was removed the experience of pride, not the actual infection, deep infection. He must give us a, a victory until he comes. But it is a recognition of our uncleanness that permits us to claim his righteousness. And the only thing that will happen after we claim his righteousness is to continue to contrast it with our uncleanness by nature. Even if we're not experiencing it, even if we're not doing uh, as the heathen, you, you know what I'm saying? Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to claim Christ as our only righteousness. And I'm going to close with this same statement. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. Amen. From that time till this, I have not always kept this in focus as I ought, but this has been my great desire to receive the reproof of Christ. There's nothing more precious than the reproof of Christ. When, when Christ, through Ellen White, reproved Wagner and Jones, it didn't mean that they were bad men. It just meant that God loved them. And he knew things about themselves they didn't learn yet. They needed to learn it. And if they would only learn it, and they did, they had their first lesson was wonderful. I mean, they passed the test. But there are other lessons. Eventually those men failed to pass the same test. And th as a result, they went out in darkness. Oh, how sad. Brothers and sisters, no matter what your experience is today, you will go out in darkness if you do not every day take up your cross. Taking up a cross really means facing our natural uncleanness and daily giving it to Christ, claiming his righteousness, keeping our focus on him rather than ourselves. Our very attempt to perfect ourselves makes it impossible for him to perfect us. But when we face our uncleanness, repentance is the key to the latter rain. 
repentance for pride, especially. Not just repentance for what we've done. Repentance for the unclean person that we are. But as soon as we accept Christ's righteousness, even while he's cleaning us up, he looks upon us as though we were as perfect as Christ. Isn't that wonderful? He treats us as though we had already finished the journey when we're just starting. And now I just want to say a final word. As I mentioned that, I can't say that without being reminded of my wife who passed away December 30. That has been a very difficult thing to deal with. But I can tell you one thing. I rejoiced from the beginning. That does not remove the pain, the sorrow, the longing. But my wife died in faith. And especially the last year, she never did pray for healing itself, except as God willed. What we both prayed for was God's will to be done. When she breathed her last, I praise God. It was difficult. It's even difficult to speak of this right now. But I want you to know, she's in the safety zone. She exercised a faith during this past year that greater than any I've seen her ever before, God was preparing her. God is responsible for your salvation. You are not. You can't save yourself. But you can claim his promises. And you can recognize that he who has been holding the winds of strife is doing so so that you can be sealed. And if you should die in that process, you are sealed. Satan can't touch my wife in any way. She's in the safety zone. I'm not. However, I don't have to be afraid. I know how undependable I am. He teaches me that. But I also have been learning more and more of how I can depend on him. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. And now I, I could speak on it, but that clock tells me that you've already been sitting too long. Shall we power, pray? Father, thank you so much for your many blessings. Thank you for your longing to save us. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come repentance. Thank you for your patience in waiting for us to be so lost that we can finally be saved. Till we understand our lostness, so that we feel the pain of our wounds, so that we are willing to face it without running, without dodging, without hiding. And understand how we can do it by claiming Jesus' righteousness now. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. This concludes our worship service, and I want to remind you, you're invited to stay for fellowship lunch. And there are two more times in the afternoon. Haven't we been blessed already? Amen. Thanks again for coming, and the ushers will uh, usher you out from the front. Thank you.